Hey, 42 here. One of the defining images of the modern age was the moment when man first set foot on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. On the 20th of July 1969, whilst the world crowded around transistor radios and those TV sets with the funny wooden trim, Neil Armstrong took one small step for a man in what was the culmination of years of experimentation and endeavour. This was the crowning glory of the post-war American dream and proof that there was nothing the United States couldn't do. They had finally conquered space, just as they had helped conquer the ultimate evil of Adolf Hitler 25 years earlier. But what most of those cheering the brave boys of Apollo 11 didn't know was just how closely connected these two world-shaping events really were. Sure, the three astronauts in the spacecraft in 1969 were as American as a bald eagle shopping in Walmart. However, many of those who made that journey possible weren't Americans, but Germans. And not just any Germans, the really, really naughty kind, Nazis. The truth is that the American space program of the 50s and 60s was overseen by scientists, technicians and engineers with an involuntary right arm raising disease, who'd been smuggled out of Germany after the war as part of the most audacious and controversial talent grab in history, codenamed Operation Paperclip. It saw more than 1,600 of the Third Reich's top scientific minds avoid trial in Europe to instead be spirited across the Atlantic to apply their expertise to areas like synthetic fuels, communication systems, and aeronautics. The US Army was especially keen to make use of the men who had knowledge of rockets, the very same rockets originally designed to rain down fiery death on America and her allies. This cadre of elite scientists was headed by Nazi rocket engineer Werner von Braun, and he was so influential to America's success in reaching the stars that he became known as Dr. Space, and was eventually enshrined in America's National Aviation Hall of Fame. With the help of his loyal band of big-brained former fascists, he ignited America's efforts to conquer outer space, and his controversial legacy would forever be entwined with man's destiny beyond the stars. Storyblocks is an incredibly vast stock library with over a million high-quality 4K and HD footage, templates, music, sound effects, images, and so much more. The best part? They offer unlimited downloads of royalty-free, professional content for one predictable subscription cost. Say goodbye to expensive pay-per-clip pricing. Plus, you can choose a monthly or annual plan with no hidden extra fees. I absolutely love using Storyblocks for this channel because anything I download with Storyblocks is 100% royalty-free forever, with no restrictions on where you can distribute your finished projects. It just gives me so much peace of mind. And if you're like me and you use Adobe Creative Cloud, you can save a ton of time by using the Storyblocks plugin. This allows you to access the entire Storyblocks library right inside Premiere Pro and After Effects. Also, you can choose from thousands of pre-made professional templates for your favorite editing program, including After Effects, Premiere Pro, and Apple Motion. This takes your videos to the next level and speeds up your creative workflow by letting you easily add motion graphics, title animations, overlays, and logo reveals to supercharge the production value of your videos. To get started with unlimited stock media downloads at one set price, head to storyblocks.com 42 or click the link in the description. And a big thanks to Storyblocks for sponsoring this video. Von Braun was obsessed with space from the age of 13 when his mother bought him a telescope. But it wasn't just what he saw in the night sky that fed his imagination. Germany in the 1920s was the place to be if you had any interest in rocket technology. Fitz von Opel, heir to the Opel Car Company, was known by the rather brilliant nickname of Rocket Fritz, and he gave public demonstrations in which he drove cars and planes he'd fitted with rockets. Ah, uh, I sure do miss those good old days when health and safety hadn't been invented yet. Naturally, this drew huge crowds, young Werner amongst them, and when his ambitious young eyes fixated upon the sight of a crazy German man driving inside a fireball of certain death, he just knew that he had to do the same. 
One of the most enthusiastic members of this little group was this 18-year-old boy, destined to become one of the giants of the American space program, Werner von Braun. Now, at 16, most boys are preoccupied trying to figure out how females function. But not von Braun. He was busy strapping fireworks to a toy wagon. He then climbed inside and lit the rockets, causing the jerry-rigged vehicle to barrel down the streets of Berlin before spectacularly blowing up. Von Braun was lucky to walk away of his life and was promptly arrested, though he was let off with a warning shortly afterwards. Rocket Fritz, sounding suspiciously like a kitchen appliance from the 60s, had lit the fuse on Von Braun's passion for space travel. But this food processor cub rocket scientist wasn't von Braun's only inspiration, because in 1930, he attended a lecture by August Picard. Picard had invented a pressurized cabin, which, when fitted to a hydrogen balloon, allowed him to travel to Earth's upper atmosphere. By the way, if that surname sounds familiar, it's probably because Patrick Stewart's character in Star Trek was named after him. The show's writers were inspired by August's ability to go where no man has gone before in a fucking balloon. In 1930, von Braun attended university in Berlin, where he immediately signed up to the Space Flight Society. Unlike most student societies, which are just an excuse to insert beer tubes into the most inappropriate holes, the Space Flight Society saw a group of rocket fanatics conducting some of their first ever experiments with liquid fueled rocket engines. But rockets weren't the only thing on the rise in Germany in the 1930s, and as the decade wore on, the country gradually fell under the malevolent spell of Adolf Hitler. Straight out of university, Werner von Braun founded his own rocket development business before going to work for the military on prototypes for guided missiles, becoming technical director of an army research centre on an island just off the northern coast of Germany. Why does everything seedy have to happen on an island? In 1937, with the Nazis now in full control, von Braun became a party member and eventually a major in the SS. He would later claim he did so purely so he could continue his research and that he was never ever involved with any political activity. Which is like saying, so yeah, basically I didn't see all the atrocities because I was busy playing with Lego in a cupboard for several years. When the Second World War broke out, that need for more effective weapons became immediately apparent and the military realised von Braun's rockets had the potential to swing the conflict in their favour. Continuing his research, the Fatherland's very own rocket man came up with the world's first long-range guided ballistic missile, the V2. Or to give it its full title, the Geltungswaffe, the vengeance weapon. Designing these rockets took the genius of von Braun and his team of scientists, but building them required the blood and sweat of many others. Almost 1.7 million people were sent to Nazi concentration camps during the course of the war, and most were used as slave labour in one form or another, including the building of armaments for the very regime that had imprisoned them. VT rockets were made in the giant Mittelwerk factory, constructed underground so it would be safe from Allied bombs. Conditions there were utterly inhumane, with inmates from the nearby Mittelbau Dora concentration camp quite literally worked to death. When the V2s were finally unleashed in late 1944, an estimated 9,000 Allied soldiers and civilians were killed. But the tragic irony is that that figure is substantially lower than the 12,000 who lost their lives building them in the first place. In April 1945, as the war drew to a close, von Braun and over 400 other scientists were moved to a secure location where they were guarded by an elite unit to keep them from being captured by the Allies. As it became evident that World War II was going to be one of those where the bad guys lose, Hitler sent orders that everyone involved with the development of rockets should be gassed, so their knowledge didn't fall into enemy hands. But word somehow got through to von Braun, and for some reason, he didn't like the sound of that plan at all. So he came up with one of his own to get himself and his fellow scientists the hell out of there post haste. Commandeering a train, they escaped into the mountains of southern Germany and over the border into Austria, 
Werner and his brother Magnus subsequently surrendered to American forces in a rather unconventional fashion. With Magnus cycling out to find the nearest armor unit with a white bedsheet tied to his handlebars, so they knew he came in peace. Whilst it's fair to say that Hitler had some seriously out there ideas, in fact, he was kind of famous for them. He was bang on the money when it came to thinking the Allies were keen to get their hands on Nazi rocket pioneers. In fact, the Allies were so keen to do so that they dedicated an entire secret intelligence program of 2,000 people to it. This was Operation Paperclip. So called cool because when working their way through the mountains of files of potential scientists to steal, office bods in the army's ordnance corps would attach a paperclip to those who were of particular interest. They identified over 5,000 targets, and the ominously named Enemy Personnel Exploitation Section was created in order to interrogate them. This unit worked in a detention center with the code name. Now, are you ready for this? Because it's really, really badass. Dustbin. Yeah. The Dustbin was housed in Kranzberg Castle near Frankfurt. This castle had been earmarked to be Hitler's main military HQ, and hidden deep beneath the earth, beneath the imposing medieval ramparts, was an elaborate warren of concrete bunkers. Having been thoroughly debriefed, von Braun and more than 130 of his team were moved to the United States and their new home of Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas. Fort Bliss is a massive US Army base that covers some 1,700 square miles, and during the Second World War it was used to train anti-aircraft gunners and hold prisoners of war. The conditions the POWs had found themselves in weren't too different to those in which the scientists were bedded down in now sleeping in sparse huts and being fed meager rations. Still, it was preferable to the alternative Hitler had in mind for them back home in the Fatherland. Von Braun and his comrades were soon put to work refurbishing V2 rockets that had been salvaged in Germany. And after five years in Texas, this party of propulsion-loving professors were moved to another base in Alabama, where they worked on something even bigger. The rockets that were to be used for the first ever nuclear ballistic missile tests. But as we all know, inside every Nazi scientist is a little boy trying to get out. And no matter how many missiles he designed, von Braun still yearned to send men into space, just as he had as an astronomy-obsessed adolescent. As fate would have it, Werner's lifelong dream was now part of the very zeitgeist of the country that he lived in. This was 1950s America, and just like in Toy Story when Buzz replaced Woody, so the cowboys who'd been idolized for decades were being replaced by characters from space movies and sci-fi comics. Von Braun began to write about his theories of rocket trips to the moon and orbital space stations, articles which were published not in dusty science journals, but in newspapers and national magazines. He even found himself working with Walt Disney, acting as technical director to free Disney films about space exploration. But behind all his publicity and fantasy was the reality of the space race between the United States and the Soviet Union with each superpower desperate to outdo the other in a bid to gain strategic control of the great black battleground outside Earth's atmosphere. In 1957, the Soviets launched the first ever satellite, Sputnik 1, into orbit, and the US, fearful of falling behind the communist curve, responded by creating the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, better known as NASA, which, at least in the beginning, was dedicated to one thing, getting shit into space real quick. And who is at the top of the government's professional spaceship flinger list? Well, that's right, the man who put the SS into the United States, Werner von Braun. He was made director of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in 1960. His appointment proved to be a crucial turning point that would lead to the Americans putting a man on the moon less than a decade later. Von Braun and his team had been working on rockets that could carry a spacecraft into orbit. They were named the Saturn series, and they were eventually used in the Apollo space program throughout the 1960s. 
Saturn V launched the Apollo 11 mission to the moon, and in culmination of his life's work, Von Braun was right there in launch control in the Kennedy Space Center. He wasn't the only ex-Nazi in attendance either. The director of the Kennedy Space Center was Kurt Debus, an old colleague of Von Braun from his days building V2 rockets for the Reich. Debus had also come to America as one of 1,600 Nazi scientists secretly recruited as part of Operation Paperclip. For their roles in helping an American astronaut set foot on the moon before any other, both Von Braun and Debus were awarded the NASA Distinguished Service Medal, one of the highest accolades a NASA employee can earn. It's one of the great twists of fate that many of the men who played a role in one of the darkest chapters in our history then made a lasting contribution to one of the most hopeful. Maybe it was always fated to be that way. After all, is it just a coincidence that NASA and Nazi are only two letters different? Well, yes. Yes, it is, obviously. Still, the scientists who were covertly brought to the USA after the war helped their adopted country to win the space race, and the patents and innovative technologies they created would go on to be worth $10 billion. Over the years, they rose to the top positions of some of the most important and influential government agencies in the world. Truly a case of keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. Thanks for watching.